Mr. Leroy, I'm seeing you coming. Did you see me coming? Yeah, I got a rear mirror right there. I thought I'd better. I said, get up and we can start running. <laughs> Mr. Leroy, are you Oh, 
is in the hospital. He's being treated for COVID. And he is on a ventilator. Uh, he is in an induced coma. Well, Lord, we break him up to you. Uh, we pray. Uh, we pray for an elbow, Lord. We could even touch him. Would you just heal him? And that this ventilator would get the air that he needs, but then uh, his lungs would clear up, Lord. Um, guide the doctors. The treatments are so much better. We pray he would get the good treatment that he needs. And Lord, we want to lift up Larry uh, Holman to you. He has. Uh, He's been on the cancer list for some time, but he passed away this last Wednesday from that. Uh, so we pray for the family of Larry Horn. Uh, we pray, Lord, that his family would have, find comfort. Um, we pray, Lord, that uh, you would bring hope and a new life into, into the family, even as they grieve. Help them to grieve as one who grieves with hope. Lord, we lift up the west coast of our nation to you. The fires that are uh, killing people, that are rampaging, Lord, we just pray for your safety for those who are responding. We pray, Lord, that the fires would be under control. Help people to be wise, uh, to leave when they need to leave, or take the steps that they're told to take. And Lord, uh, lots of things happening in, in the state of California, Lord, we just pray that you would have a mercy and that your grace would flow in that state as well as, as in ours. Um, we lift up Tammy, who is Terry Ripperman's girlfriend, a bacterial infection. She's in a hospital in Ann Arbor. Lord, we pray for Tammy that you would bring healing to her body, Lord, that uh, this infection would be defeated. And we ask all this in the healing name of Jesus, Lord, that you would just touch her. Uh, touch her body, but also touch her heart. Help her to know that she is yours and you want her. Help her to be a child of, of yours and to trust in you. Um, and we lift up uh, Jeff to you, Lord. He's going to have another surgery this week, kind of a routine follow. Uh, but Lord, we, he needs your healing. You have been healing his body, and we pray for Jeff, you're doing it pretty well, Lord. Pray that you would heal his body. We pray that you would also be an encouragement for his soul. Uh, help him to be encouraged that this is a process that he just needs to go through and that. Your hand will be on him, Lord, and may your will be done in his, in his life, in his body, in his heart. Uh, thank you for his faith, and I thank you for the encouragement he brings to, to all of us. Lord, thank you again for this body. Lord, I lift up the Gwens to you as they're all at a family wedding, most of them, to a family wedding today. We pray that uh, you would help them get back safely, but also help them to be a blessing to, this, um, to the church community that they are at today. Um, help them, Lord, to bring the life of Christ into the fellowship of believers that are there. We pray for those who, in this Russian Orthodox Church that they would have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Um, and thank you, Lord, for giving us a personal relationship with you. May we learn to walk with you, talk with you, and just enjoy life uh, as you are with us all the time. And Lord, we Lift all these things to you in your precious name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Well, we are going through the book of Romans. And uh, we're on a rather tough uh, passage today. But if you have a book, if you have a book, a uh, Bible, um, you may have a book, you may have a phone, but turn to Romans. I have everything I need up here except for the gospel. Turn to Romans. Romans chapter 1. This is an example of in how in Scripture sometimes you, you, you need to read more than one chapter at a time. Remember, I asked everyone to read chapters 1 and 2. You really should read those two together um, because if you just read chapter 1, it can lead you to apply what Paul is saying in the wrong way. Uh, we want to do the right thing the right way. And that is to do it the way that Jesus would do it. Okay, now I'm going to read from verses 26 through 2, verse 4 in a, in a moment. Um, but I recently learned of a, of, of, of a 
of somebody who was famous across America. Does the name Edwin Cooper ring a bell to anybody? Edwin Cooper. Had he given us only in 60 types. We, I didn't recognize that name either. Uh, but he was famous across America, but nobody knew his real name. He came from a family of circus clowns. Cooper began performing before audiences when he was just nine years old. After a stint with Barnum and Bailey Circus, he, he became a fixture on television in the 50s as Bozo the Clown. Remember Bozo? I should put a picture of him up there. He got so well known, people say, oh, what a Bozo. Oh, Bozo. I shouldn't do that. Well, in addition to entertaining both young and old, Cooper had a message for his buddies and partners every week. His message, get checked for cancer. Get checked for cancer. And yet Cooper was so busy working, he neglected to follow his own advice. By the time his cancer was discovered, it was too late. And he could not be treated. Well, Edward Cooper died at just 41 years of age from a disease that he had warned others to watch out for. How how sad is that? Well, sin, sin is a far more deadly uh, disease than most aggressive and fast-growing cancers. Um, sin kills, sin destroys everything it touches. From the fall of Adam in the Garden of Eden until now, sin takes no prisoners. This is the purpose behind everything that Satan does. Jesus says that the Thief comes not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. Because of his evil nature and his hatred of everything good, the devil brings destruction to everything that, uh, that it comes within his reach. Well, well, when we regard sin as God does, we find nothing amusing or humorous about it. Sin is, is sin. So my title of today is What's So Sad About Sin? Um, sin, you know, we will not make it the subject of, of the jokes we tell or, or those we hear. We'll not allow ourselves to be tempted to get a little closer to the line to see if we are still safe. God hates sin with a holy and righteous fury, and so should we. When we find ourselves amused by sin, it's time to focus on the cross, see the price paid for our sin reminds us that it is no laughing matter. Well, as we've been reading through Romans, I wanted us to focus on these things. Remember these things as you read through it, that this is a letter. It is written by the Apostle Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, unashamed servant of Christ Jesus. He is unashamed of the gospel salvation for those who believe. Remember, too, that this is written to fellow believers in a nasty society. So he's going to describe what's going on in the nasty society. Just remember that this is written to fellow believers. Now, either he thinks these Romans are, the Roman Christians are, are uh, falling into the pattern of their society, or maybe he's encouraging them to get out of those patterns if they're already in them because now they trust in Christ. Uh, or maybe he's just letting them know, look, you're, you're at risk because you live in a nasty society. And he's going to lay that out for us. He's going to give us some details. Remember that the repeated themes that we have seen uh, throughout this book, throughout his, um, his letter, you're going to see God's grace and your faith. You're going to see salvation. God is the one who saved. But our behavior is important. So God's salvation and our behavior, right? And then another theme, of course, is redemption by the blood of Christ. And then sin. And oh, does he hammer sin? And he called, you know, he puts himself in the place, too. It's not it's not accusing. We're going to read that passage right now. Um, and we're going to find as we read it, we're going to learn what's wrong with Rome. Okay, let's go to verse 26 of 
chapter 1, so we have, we have already read, read through most of chapter 1. Uh, the people have no excuse for what they believe, for, for their behavior, because they, they rejected God. Okay. Because of this, because of this rejection of God, because that they would rather worship created idols than the creation, uh, than the creator, I'm sorry, they worship creation instead of the creator. Because of this, God gave them over to shameful lusts. Even their women exchanged natural relations for unnatural ones. In the same way, the men also abandoned natural relations with women and were inflamed with lust for one another. Men committed indecent acts with other men and received in themselves the due penalty for their perversion. Furthermore, since they did not think it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of he gave them over to a depraved mind to do what ought not to be done. They have become filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, greed, and depravity. So now he's, he's giving us more. This is what this depraved mind leads to. It leads to things like they're full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, and malice. They are gossips, slanderers, God haters, insolent, arrogant, and boastful, they invent ways of doing evil. They disobey their parents. They are senseless, faithless, heartless, ruthless. Although they, again, these are the ones who uh, God gave over to do what they felt they had to do or wanted to do. Although they uh, although they know God's righteous decree that those who do such things deserve death, they not only continue to do these things, but also approve of those who practice them. You, therefore, Roman Christians, you, therefore, have no excuse. You who pass judgment on someone else. For at whatever point you judge the other, you are condemning yourself. Because you who pass, uh, because you who pass judgment on them, uh, do the same thing. You do the same thing. So. Now we know that God's judgment against those who do such things is based on truth. So when you, a mere man, pass, pass judgment on them, and yet do the same things, do you think you will escape God's judgment? Or do you show contempt for the riches of his kindness, tolerance, and patience, not realizing that God's kindness leads you toward repentance. This is the word of God. And Lord, as we have read this word today, uh, may it pierce our hearts, may it uh, transform our minds as we unpack the truths that we see listed here from uh, the, the wonderful and great Apostle Paul. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, So, there's trouble in Rome. What's wrong with Rome? Well, first of all, they're breaking God's natural laws. Uh, it comes from being, they were they wanted to be their own God, God of their own life. They didn't want to um, follow the, what they knew God wanted them to do. Um, and you could say this, he, he, God gave them over to lust, to these shameful lusts, as Paul says, and it leads to shameful acts. So we need to watch out for these lusts, don't we? Because they can lead to shameful, and often do, shameful acts. Whatever you think about is what you end up doing. And he refers to, he uses the word unnatural in a number of times. He uses it. He says, he's speaking about sexual relations, and he's saying that it's, it's unnatural. It, it's not the way God designed nature. It's unnatural. And isn't it interesting? And isn't it interesting that... Whoops. Sorry. <laughs> it, it's, it's really, it's good. We're going to get to the good news. Okay. Um, so it, it's, it's kind of ironic that these ones who were worshiping creation, that they lifted nature above the one who created nature, 
Then they wanted to do things in unnatural ways. Unnatural is something to remember. He calls it. Well, what, 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 so what is so sad about sin? Sin worships creation and not the creator. When you do that, you call it all kinds of unnatural behavior. Breaking God's moral laws, right? So what we see here is that sin leads to spiritual and physical death. And sin is a slippery slope. I'm sure that's filling in your minds there. Sin is a slippery slope. You know what that is. Once you get on a slippery slope, the grass could be going. I was on a metal roof one time, and the roof went down like this, and then it was uh, a porch. The porch roof was not as steep. And I was up on the steep part, and I thought, well, I'm just going to slide down. I wanted to go down to there, uh, to, the, to the flatter part, so I'm like, well, I'm just going to slide down. So Steve's over here going, you know you did. Yes, I did. That wasn't too many years ago. You know what happens when you slide down a metal roof? It's slippery. You go fast. <laughs> and I thought, well, my shoes, I can, I can break my metal. No. I mean, I, I think, uh, even through my gloves, I caught one of those screw heads to stop me. And then there's a guy up here at the left, and he reaches down and grabs me. And um, so it wasn't too long ago. I was back in Wesley and his, your niece's house we were working on. And I almost slid right off that porch roof and probably would have broken a leg or something. Uh, but so I understand what a slippery, literally what a slippery slope is. Um, and, and sin is one of those addictive things, you know. The more you do it, the more you, it, what you did is exciting at first, but then it doesn't, it's not good enough. So you, you do more, you take it further. Once you cross the line to sin, you, you can just keep going further and further and slide down a slippery slope. And uh, approved sin does spread. In fact, it spreads like cancer spreads. Not just with the individual, but through others who are encouraged. Your sin is with you, it's okay. You can go ahead and do that. See how you do it? You can go ahead and do it too. It spreads like cancer. So, what's so sad about sin? Well, sin comes naturally when it is not right. The sad thing is, it does, it does kind of come, it comes naturally because we have inherited the, um, as Wesley put it, a bent towards sin. In other words, we, we've inherited this sin nature. So all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Sin comes naturally to us. We shouldn't be surprised when darkness is dark. You know, when I look back on myself before I was walking with the Lord and I think of some of the things I did, you know, I think, wow. Uh, but I shouldn't be surprised because I was walking in the darkness at that point. I wasn't walking. But it things that you only do in the dark. Well, I was much better. I'm so glad I'm the Lord and stay in the dark. Mm -hmm. uh, so that was like the second paragraph of what we had. So we've seen uh, people breaking God's natural laws. And then they keep going and they break uh, God's moral laws. Uh, you can find the Ten Commandments in that list of things. Evil. Invent new evil things to do, right? Okay. So we have the breaking of natural and moral laws. We also have the breaking of Jesus' command to love. And this is where it gets hard for us Christians to find the balance, right? Um, because of what we just read, this list of terrible sins, we may find ourselves condemn people who do those things. And Paul's saying, you can't condemn anybody. You can't judge anybody because you do the same things. Well, maybe I don't exactly do the same things, but have I ever done this or that or that? Yeah, I can find things that in that list that I've done. I've done those things. Who am I to accuse anybody else or to condemn someone else? See how it starts to get hard because you're like, well, wait a minute. It's wrong, and isn't it right to say it's wrong? <laughs> isn't it really kind of good scripture? Well, let's get to that a little while. But remember, when you're tempted to accuse someone, even in your prayers, have you ever kind of done that? Well, Lord, that person, you know that person is doing that today? You know? You kind of go to them with an to the Lord with an accusing, an accusing attitude. Uh, basically, 
basically you're doing the devil's job today. Because it's the accuser's job to accuse the brother, right? He accuses. So don't, uh, it's, accusing people is not our job. Leave accusation to the capital A accuser. Um, and so we see a little grace and mercy of people who believe in Jesus don't take into account the beginning of chapter 2. Uh, you will be prone to be judgmental and not grace, full of grace and mercy. Okay. So what's, what's Paul's point in that third paragraph? What's Paul's point? Well, we are all sinners. And no one is any better than anyone else. No one is worse than anyone else. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. He's going to get that right later on in the book. So he keeps going back to this concept of, of sin. Uh, so, does any of that stuff sound familiar for today? I mean, we got trouble too, don't we? But we see that any and all sexual relations are approved and applauded. And it's just, it's a slippery slope. You see the slippery slope? And it's getting worse and worse and worse. If this is okay, well then why is it there? Well then maybe that should be okay too. I can give you so many examples, but you know the examples. I really don't need to. I'm trying to get you to look at the concepts here that he's talking about. Uh, I don't want to blast him and stand here and tell him. He said it. Paul said it. What those things are that people And you know, sexual relations are approved and applauded. You know, it, it used to be that, it, so that sex was reserved for marriage between men and women. Now, that that's, that that ship has unsailed and went back to And yeah, it's done. Uh, now it's like if, if you have them before you get married, you do with an eyeball. Calling evil good and good evil. Wow. We see that all the time. Calling evil good and good evil. And then the third one is the feeling I wanted you to think about, which is cold hearted Christians accuse and condemn. I've been there, you've been there. We can get cold hearted. Uh, and in our coldness, we can turn around and want to hammer somebody for what they're doing that they should not be doing. When we know the Word of God and we have the Lord and we have the Holy Spirit and we're not going to do it. We know better. Sometimes we just can't help accuse and condemn. But again, that's not our job. So I'm going to get to what is our job. That's not our job. And if you're judgmental you know, type of personality, uh, you struggle with this maybe more than others. I did one of those personality tests in college and in seminary. One of the things I came up with when I was, uh, there's perceiving and then there's judging. And yeah, I'm judging. I'm a judger. I can fall into, I, I evaluate everything and say, that's good and then that's just, you know, and I, I had to reprogram myself because my natural thing is toward the judging side. Even if I love that person, I can still be judging them if I'm not careful. So I personally have had to struggle with I don't want to be cold-hearted. And I've hammered on this in so many sermons over the years. It's what Jesus talked about in Matthew 24. He said that people will do anything. In the end times, people are going to do whatever they want to do. And the love of many believers, I'm inserting that word, but the love of many will grow cold. Because of what we see, the love of many, us, can grow cold. So that's a warning by Jesus himself. Don't let yourself be cold-hearted are, uh, you need to get warm and fussy there. <laughs> you need to go to your happy place, like my wife said. <laughs> you need to get that warm and fuzzy feeling, the love of Jesus back in your heart. Uh, what's so sad about sin? Well, we're all sinners. Sin bad, God good. Sin bad, God good. As far as I understand, sin bad, God good. Okay. Here's what Jesus commands. Do not judge, and you will not be judged. 
Do not condemn, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Wow. It says similar things in Matthew. So we're not allowed to. I think this is from the Sermon on the Plain. Yeah. If you really know about it, it's the Sermon on the Plain. That's why I put it. A bunch of people get in it and do the same thing. Some of the Beatitudes and some other things. And then talk about He got around to judging. Do not judge and you will not be judged. Don't condemn. It's not a judge. All right. So today, uh, so that's what God was doing back in the day. He was warning people even then. Through his son, and we have it written down as a warning to us. Be careful with, with this issue. And yet we know we're not supposed to be silent. You know, am I saying just be silent, just let them do whatever they want, case or or Sail a bee, be bitter. You know, just let it live forever. You know? Uh, to each his own. I think I used to say that one a lot. But to each his own. Like, well, no, wait a minute. We're not supposed to be silent. See, Paul wasn't silent. He called it out, didn't he? And he was warning Christians, don't fall for it. Don't fall into it. Be careful. But don't judge people. So, well, wait a minute. But he wasn't silent. He doesn't want us to be silent. So what do we do? I want to give you an example of what's happening in this in this day and age, as uh, there's a movement in, in the nation where they have you they view worship as a weapon, and so they were calling people together as to worship. And I mentioned about this gentleman by the name of Sean Floyd, and um, he has been going around the nation. And so, but let's hear it uh, in in his own words in this video. Um, traveling teams, I'm going to show you a video in just a moment. There kind of is a mop in the bottom. Um, revival, awakenings, baptism. You can see things that have been happening over the last couple, three months as this gentleman and others have been going around uh, calling for Christians to gather to worship and people are getting saved, they're getting baptized, they're, they're being really woke, <laughs> they're really waking up to their need for a Savior. Um, so I found a nice little excerpt from an interview with Sean. I'd like to play that for you. The city of Seattle accused of discrimination for closing a park ahead of a planned prayer rally. The city says it shut the park down due to, quote, anticipated crowding from the Christian event despite left-wing protests that continued throughout the city. But the showdown didn't stop the prayer rally, which was held in the street. Let us worship rally organizer and founder of Hold the Line, Sean Foyt, joins us now. Hey, Sean, so good to see you again. Hey. Good oh, morning. so good to be with you guys. Well, good we morning. just love what you're doing. I know you're traveling around cities and you've been promoting um, revival instead of riots. But the city of Seattle, what happened over the weekend when you tried to do that in Seattle? Well, you know, it's so wild because yesterday they had on 4th Avenue in Seattle, they had a team of rioters throwing mob cocktails at policemen. And yet the city focused their energy on a peaceful worship and prayer rally in Gas Forks Park. They barricaded the whole park and put fences around. I don't even know how many how much tax dollars was wasted on that. And uh, we're blocking this out from gathering the worship. What was their reason? What did they tell you? They just said anticipated crowding from an event. I mean, we were the only event that was planned. You know, we were the only rally that was scheduled to be there. So it was obviously a targeting and a discrimination towards believers in the city. What do you think the real reason is? I mean, I, you know, there's just a bias. You know, there it's the height of hypocrisy right now that they're letting these cities, you know, uh, succumb to rioting and burning and pillaging, and yet they're targeting Christians. Yeah, so this is what the city of Seattle said about closing down the park. They said, I have concerns for the safety of all those who visit Gasworks Park. We have opted to close the entire <coughs> park for the day. Seattle Parks and Recreation does not allow unpermitted public events to take place in Seattle Parks and ask the public to continue to adhere to current public health guidelines so that we can keep our parks open. You know, Sean, I know you traveled around. That was your 21st city. Why are you doing this, and what are the crowds telling you? Well, by the way, last night it was a pretty easy, uh, you know, we just pivoted and we called it a worship protest. So now technically it's legal. 
and we went to the streets. But yeah, what we're experiencing across America is, especially with the churches being closed and, you know, these godless politicians that are taking aim at the church, you know, people are rising up. There's a backlash that's growing. We had 12,000 people that gathered with us at the Capitol in Sacramento two nights ago. And it's just continuing to build momentum. Sean, tell us about your story. I mean, you, did you get saved in college? Is that, I was reading about your life last night. And it said, what that happened? Well, I grew up in church, and my parents were both um, full-time medical missionaries. And so I grew up watching the move of God in other uh, nations in the world. And really have largely been focused on other nations until the pandemic hit. And we just, you know, wasn't able to travel anywhere. And so I felt like the Lord said, focus on your nation for the sake of your children, you know, fight for America. And so that's what we've been doing. I know you have four beautiful children, your beautiful wife. And uh, thanks so much for always coming on our show and saying yes to our invitation. Thanks so much for what you're doing. Our country needs faith right now. We need God more than ever. Thank you, guys. Thanks for supporting us. It really means the world. You're welcome. God bless you. Well, 21 cities, can you imagine? 21 cities it's been through so far. And where have you heard about it? Unless you're searching for it online, you're not going to hear about it. Uh, and that interview from Fox, that was on YouTube, so I thought I should be able to show that. If they can put it on YouTube, I should be able to show it here. Uh, we'll see if the lords of Facebook decide that that's a problem, but I did that. We'll see. Because they do check. Uh, and, or maybe it will be the, the gators of YouTube that decide. When I post it to YouTube, YouTube will get decide. But, uh, you know, yeah, you can't post that because it's already on YouTube. Yes. Anyway, all those. <laughs> uh, but did you, see, did, you, did you sense you know, the joy that Sean has that he's been able to do this? Um, I've heard before from him that he has gone around used to do it around the world, and then the Lord told me to do it here in America. Uh, so this is this is not a new thing for him, but it's new to do it here. And uh, we, he's been to Kenosha, Wisconsin, New York City. He was here to show the video last year, last week about that in Boston. Um, so it's really it's really cool uh, to realize that the Spirit of God is moving, uh, that people are finding uh, redemption and regeneration. So, the first, well, how do you speak the truth without touch? Remain grateful for your salvation. Remember the chains that used to hold you in bondage. Be grateful for your salvation. Always have a grateful heart toward God when you need to challenge or sort of, uh, maybe it feels like you're going to enter into a conflict with somebody, but you know you need to speak the truth with love. Well, if you do it from a grateful heart, that's the first thing. The second thing is ask yourself, is my motive pure? What is my motive? Do I really want to help this person or I just want to? Do I want to just hurt them? I was trying to find a, a, a clip or a, a, like a clip art of the Bible as a hammer, you know. Are we trying to hurt people or are we really trying to help them? So examine your motive that's always... Don't be the prosecutor, judge, and jury, but be an advocate for Christ. Um, and think about this concept. This, this, the three R's of what we need to be teaching our kids. I mentioned this last year. Last week, and some of you may know couldn't be here with the holiday weekend. But um, Charles Spurgeon, a great preacher in the 19th century, he said, uh, whatever you leave out, Make sure you teach your children the three R's. Ruin, redemption, and regeneration. Ruin, redemption, regeneration. Our world is ruined by sin. You see that as of Genesis chapter 3. And then through the rest of the book of the Bible, almost the rest of the entire Bible is all about God's redeeming plan to get a relationship back with his uh, number one creation, which is humanity. And then right around Revelation 19, we see the world being regenerated, being made new. Heaven and earth will pass away, but the word of God will last forever. And then 
know, the, the, the new Jerusalem will come down from heaven. That's all at the end of the book of Revelation. But see, that also applies individually. These three eyes apply to our lives, too. Sin ruined our lives from the very beginning. Whether we're aware of it or not. The kids are not born innocent. You know, we've said that. Kind of feel like, well, they're so innocent. Well, really, the truth is we are born into a sinful ancestry. And so our lives are ruined by sin from the get go. Um, <laughs> but the good news is Jesus paid for those sins. And he redeems us. In other words, when you redeem something, Take your coupon, you redeem it for something of value. So Jesus was the redeemer who was given to pay for you. Um, a person of great worth in the eyes of God. You were worth the death of his son. Sometimes I hear people say, oh, well, I'm not worthy. Well, that's true, you aren't worthy. But Jesus was worthy to pay the sin for your sins. So don't ever think you're worth less. You're not worth it. You're worth the good death of the Son. You're very valuable. Every human soul. Right? So we're ruined by sin. We're redeemed by Jesus on the cross. Regenerated. Into a new person. And that is what's really, what's so sad about sin is sin sends God because personal relationship with God. They rejected God, they, they ignored Him, and they've chosen to go in this direction instead of toward God. Um, but we know that heaven celebrates when a sinner repents. When a sinner becomes born again, uh, the angels in heaven celebrate, and we have a great party whenever somebody comes to faith in Christ. So just remember that. There was a party in heaven when you came to faith in Jesus. How cool. But sin is sad because it saddens the heart of God. It's hard to think of God as, like, you think he's so good, he's going to be joyful all the time and happy. You no, know, we grieve the Holy Spirit all the time when we fall into sin and anger. So we know that that's not right, and yet sometimes we fall into it. Um, so I want to encourage you to just think about those three R's ruin, redemption, and regeneration. Uh, you know, it's just a fancy alliteration. Regeneration, you know what that means. Okay, you be made new. Make a new creature into a new person. Well, I want to sing a uh, song for you, Jesse and I are going to sing a song that we have, have uh, enjoyed in the past. It's a little bit, it has a note of sadness to it. It's kind of interesting. It's a testimony. Today I found myself after searching all these years. The thing that I saw wasn't at all what I thought it would be. I was lost when you found me here. I was broken on my hands. Then you came along, you sang the song over me. Feels like I'm born again. Feels like I'm leaving. For the very first time. For the very first time.
to have mercy upon them. Pray that you would have mercy and grace, that your grace would flow, that that pre, uh, prevenient grace would flow in people's hearts, even though they, they are maybe even rejecting you, or they aren't even aware of you, Lord, that you begin drawing them. Draw them to these videos that are on YouTube, or on TikTok, or Christian stuff is on there, Lord. Draw people uh, through social media, and help them to, to, to see that there, are, that there is revival and that there is joy. Uh, Lord, thank you for calling us uh, to be sad about sin just like you are. And help, thank you for letting us feel just a little bit of what you feel. And bring the children to the next year. There may be. Spirit and truth. Help us to pray in the Spirit for those who need to know you and the Spirit of God. We'll thank you and we'll give you the praise in the name of Jesus. Paul, his family said. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, I have a few things to share with you on family family, family matters. As we are finding a new normal, things got back to normal today. You know, there was nine or ten people in Sunday school this morning. That was cool. Adult Sunday school is, is starting up again. Uh, another thing that we are going to do again this fall and Advent season, now's the time to start, even though Christmas season is still quite a way off, and that is Operation uh, Christmas Child. It's the Ministry of Samaritan's Purse, which is part of the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association. And uh, Operation Christmas Child is where we pack shoeboxes. And in addition to the things that we put in there, everything from toys and toothbrushes, um, the Samaritan's Purse Ministry will put in there uh, books about how to know Jesus. And local pastors will walk the children through this. And this might be one of the only Christmas presents that, that they ever get. And, uh, and they also get to hear the good news of 
what Christmas really is all about, the good news of the coming of Jesus. Uh, so you can pack a box, you can pack the light. There's a basket out there. We're already starting to collect some things. If you want to see what types of things, just look in that basket out there. Also, there's a rummage sale of items right there on the other side of the wall there, across the bathrooms. And then what we do there every year is people bring in things that they don't need anymore. They'd like to sell. If you want something to sell, you can put it on the table. Any money raised for that is going to go from shipping because each box, and I'll be provide the box, but we provide the I think it was nine dollars <coughs> for the shipping. Does that sound right? It's the same this year, nine, nine dollars. I guess Jerry, I think we how many boxes do we need? Thirty five ish. I think we could take more than that, couldn't we? Did we do more than that? I know we wanted five fifty. So I this know. year. We I wanted think. fifty and never made up. We didn't quite make fifty, but we well, want to make fifty this year. Vicki and I are competing, and she's already got her twenty done, and so that means who's got twenty already? Vicky. Vicky. And so that she's means I've got it. She's already got twenty. So we should be able to hit the fifty. Yeah. I think the rest of us can yeah. handle putting stuff for thirty boxes. Yeah. So anyway, that's gonna that's a fun thing that we all get into. I appreciate uh, appreciate you taking advantage of that blessing. These children around the world. It's time for our two forty two groups to start up again. 242 is based on Acts 242. We have small groups that meet because in Acts 242, they devoted themselves, they, the New Christian Church, devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. And so those are the four things that we incorporate in our 242 meetings. We used to have a few that met in homes. Now we're going to meet here in the church. We're not going to be carrying germs into people's homes and stuff, we're going to bring it up here in the church, just like you are now, but separated, you know, keep the distance, and we can have some discussion. Uh, so, Sundays at 9.45, uh, in the sanctuary is the adult school uh, class that Larry teaches. We're going to get our music practice done early enough so that we can, uh, Larry can use the sanctuary, you all can come in and spread out for that. Tuesdays at 6 30 p.m. will be here in the sanctuary. I'll be leading that meeting. And then also, if you're available lunchtime on Thursdays, I have a, a small group Bible study for this 242 in my office, the boardroom there, uh, at noon. It's a lunch meeting. If you want to bring lunch, great. If not, that's fine. But uh, Thursdays at noon. Uh, and here's what we're going to do Tuesday nights. If you're thinking, Mom, how about the church Tuesday night? What are we going to do? It's this. We're going to study the fate of Satan. And I have a DVD series, so you're going to get to watch the author talk about this. Living, the, the subtitle of his book was, I don't know if there's going to read it, Living Free from the Deadly Trap of Offense. Do you think people are getting offended these days? It's a timely thing uh, for us to look at that. So the fate of Satan is for us to become offended by every little thing. And so he's going to unpack this for us. The, the videos are 20, 25 minutes, so we'll watch the video and then we'll discuss them and talk about them and answer, answer questions and, and have our time of fellowship and prayer and share in the Lord's Supper. Sweet. Now, did I miss anything else? Is there any other family members? I think that. Did you say your Thursday meeting was? It's in the morning, right? Or the Thursday know? meeting is at noon. It's lunchtime. Yeah, it's a lunchtime Bible study. So we just look at whatever scripture we have. We might decide we want to go through you know, some of the uh, biggest things that we look at uh, Thursdays at noon in the office for big lunch. It'll be great. We need to, need to have more coming to that. Maybe later. I think she said I wanted to do the longer one. We should go just about noon. This yeah, we'll probably go 6 or 8 minutes. Try to do the Thursday once an hour because there's some that come from lunch during the lunch hour on their job. Um, so, but we offer them all the world. Uh, and then our offering today will be handled just as we have been doing for the last 13, 14 weeks. Um, we just use these boxes, one at the side door, one at the door, the double doors there. Uh, just put your offering in there and to the Lord. Right? Uh, our church is doing well financially and it's because y'all have been faithful in your giving. So uh, 
by the believers, you know, we are self-funded from our own contributions, you know, and we see money from everybody else. So we're doing, you guys are doing a great job, and it's going to help us. It's going to help us through additional ministry uh, in the future and continue for the ministries that we have now. Uh, so let's stand. Jesse, would you come up and help me with the doxology? I sing praises of the Lord, the doxology. He is one great praise of God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in so many ways. Hi, Don. Hi, Jennifer. Hi, Belva. Nice to see you. God bless you. 